Welcome, dear listeners, to another episode of our podcast. Today, we embark on a journey into the shadowy alleys of human history, where deception dances with trust and tales of audacity leave us both astonished and appalled. Today, we delve deep into the world of scams and the masterminds behind them, the con artists. Have you ever wondered why people fall for scams? Is it sheer gullibility, or is there a more profound psychological play at work? The truth is, scams have existed for as long as humanity itself. From the snake oil salesmen of yesteryears to the sophisticated cyber frauds of today, the art of deception has evolved, but its essence remains unchanged. At the heart of every scam is a story, a narrative so compelling, so believable, that it blurs the lines between reality and fiction. And the protagonists of these stories? The con artists. These are not just mere tricksters, they are storytellers, psychologists, and actors rolled into one. They understand human desires, fears, and aspirations, and they weave tales that resonate with these very emotions. But what drives a con artist? Is it just the lure of easy money, or is there a deeper, more complex motivation? Some might argue that it's the thrill of the chase, the adrenaline rush of deceiving someone and getting away with it. For others, it might be a desperate bid for survival in a world that has been unkind to them. But regardless of their reasons, one thing is clear. Con artists have left an indelible mark on our history, teaching us lessons about trust, skepticism, and the age-old battle between good and evil. As we journey through today's episode, we'll uncover tales that will make you question everything you thought you knew about trust. We'll introduce you to characters whose audacity will leave you speechless and victims whose stories will tug at your heartstrings. So buckle up, dear listeners, as we dive into the mesmerizing world of scams and the enigmatic minds of the con artists behind them. Let's move on to the first story. In the bustling streets of New York, amidst the towering skyscrapers and the ceaseless hum of life, there lies a tale so audacious, so incredible, that it has become the stuff of legend. Today, dear listeners, we journey back in time to the late 1800s, to the heart of the Big Apple, where a man named George C. Parker wove a web of deceit so intricate that it left an indelible mark on the annals of history. Imagine, if you will, the iconic Brooklyn Bridge, standing tall and proud, connecting the boroughs of Manhattan and Brooklyn. A marvel of engineering, a symbol of progress, and for some, a golden opportunity for mischief. Enter George C. Parker, a native New Yorker with a silver tongue and an uncanny ability to gain the trust of those around him. But beneath that charming facade lay the heart of a con artist, a master manipulator who saw in the Brooklyn Bridge not just a landmark, but a lucrative business opportunity. Now, most of us would look at such a monumental structure and see it for what it is, a public property, a piece of the city's infrastructure, but not Parker. Oh no, he saw it as his own personal gold mine. With audacity that's almost admirable, Parker sold the Brooklyn Bridge. Not once, not twice, but multiple times. And here's the kicker. He sold it to unsuspecting victims at least twice a week. Can you imagine the sheer gall of it? Convincing someone that they could own one of the most recognizable landmarks in the world? But how did he do it? With a combination of forged documents, fake sales offices, and a plethora of aliases. He'd introduce himself as Warden Kennedy on one day, James J. O'Brien the next, and perhaps Mr. Taylor or Mr. Roberts the day after. Each time, spinning a tale so convincing that his victims would part with their hard-earned money, believing they were the proud new owners of the Brooklyn Bridge. And the climax of this audacious scam, some of these new owners would attempt to set up toll booths on the bridge, only to be stopped by the New York police. The realization would then dawn upon them. They had been duped by one of the greatest con artists of all time. So the next time you find yourself walking across the Brooklyn Bridge, take a moment to remember George C. Parker and his audacious scams. And let it be a reminder that while the world is full of wonders, it's also peppered with cautionary tales that teach us to tread carefully, especially when something seems just a little too good to be true. But that's not all. As the sun sets over the iconic skyline of New York, Casting a golden hue over the Brooklyn Bridge, we journey across the vast expanse of the Atlantic to a land of ancient castles, rolling green hills, and tales as old as time itself. The United Kingdom, with its rich tapestry of history, has its own share of shadows, secrets, and stories that defy belief. Today, 
we delve deep into the world of international cons, where audacity knows no borders and deception wears a crown. Picture, if you will, the bustling streets of London in the roaring 1920s. The city is alive with jazz, flapper dresses, and an air of post-war optimism. But amidst the grandeur of its historic landmarks, a predator lurks, seeking out his next prey. His name? Arthur Ferguson, a man whose ambition was as vast as the empire itself and whose cunning was unparalleled. While George C. Parker was weaving his tales of deceit in New York, Ferguson was crafting his own web of lies in London. With a twinkle in his eye and a charm that could disarm even the most skeptical, he sold England's most treasured landmarks. Imagine the audacity of offering up Big Ben, the very heartbeat of London, to unsuspecting tourists, or presenting the majestic Buckingham Palace, the residence of royalty, as a property up for grabs. And just like Parker, Ferguson had a knack for selling these landmarks not just once, but multiple times over. But what drove a man to such lengths of deception? Was it sheer greed, a thirst for power, or perhaps a deep-seated need to be remembered, to leave a mark on the world? Whatever his motivations, Ferguson's cons were a masterclass in manipulation. He preyed on the naive, the hopeful, and the dreamers. Those who looked at the grandeur of England and saw an opportunity, a new beginning. And in their wide-eyed wonder, Ferguson saw his chance. So we move on to the most important deal of all. As the evening mist descends upon the River Thames and Big Ben tolls in the distance, our journey takes us further to the heart of Paris, the city of lights where romance dances with history and every cobblestone holds a secret. Amidst the serenades of the Seine and the allure of its boulevards stands the Eiffel Tower, a beacon of iron and elegance reaching for the heavens. But dear listeners, even this symbol of French pride and engineering marvel has a shadowed tale one that intertwines ambition with audacity and dreams with deceit. Close your eyes and transport yourself to Paris in the 1930s. The world is changing, and amidst the jazz clubs and art deco, a man named Victor Lustig sees an opportunity like no other. The Eiffel Tower, that magnificent structure that had once been the envy of the world at the Paris Exposition, had begun to show its age. And in its rusting beams and aging iron, Lustig saw not decay, but a golden opportunity. With a charisma that could rival the most seasoned actors of his time and a mind sharper than the finest blade, Lustig crafted a narrative so audacious it's almost poetic. He whispered tales of a tower in disrepair, of a city eager to rid itself of an aging monument and of a fortune to be made in scrap metal. And then, with the flourish of a maestro, he did the unthinkable. He sold the Eiffel Tower. Not once, but twice. Imagine the scene potential buyers, their eyes wide with anticipation, gathered in clandestine meetings, secret documents exchanged, and hushed conversations about the deal of a lifetime. Lustig, with his impeccable suits and persuasive charm, painting a picture of a Paris ready to part with its beloved tower. And they believed him. They handed over vast sums of money, dreaming of the riches that the iron of the Eiffel Tower would bring them. But when they went to stake their claim, the reality hit them like a cold Parisian wind. They had been duped by a mastermind. As we leave behind the shimmering lights of Paris and the towering silhouette of the Eiffel Tower, our narrative takes a curious turn, venturing into the realm of the truly bizarre. In the vast tapestry of human history, filled with tales of ambition, love, and betrayal, there exists a corner, shadowed and often overlooked, where the stories are not just strange, but utterly bewildering. Today, dear listeners, we delve into the world of bizarre scams, where reality often surpasses the wildest of imaginations. Imagine, for a moment, the vast expanse of the internet in its early days, a digital frontier teeming with possibilities, where the lines between the tangible and the virtual were still being drawn. In this nascent world, a man from Australia saw not just bytes and pixels, but a canvas for his audacious dream. And what did he choose to sell? Not a painting, not a relic, but an entire country. Yes, New Zealand, with its majestic mountains and shimmering lakes, was put up for auction on eBay. The audacity of it, a nation's legacy, its history, its very soul, reduced to a listing, starting at a mere 0.01 Australian dollars. As bids poured in, reaching a staggering $3,000, the world watched in bemused disbelief. 
Could a country with its rich tapestry of cultures and traditions really be sold to the highest bidder? But the realm of bizarre scams doesn't end there. Journey back with me to Wichita Falls, Texas in 1919. Here, J.D. McMahon painted a dream of towering heights, of a skyscraper that would pierce the heavens. Investors, their eyes gleaming with dollar signs, poured in $200,000, envisioning a monument to prosperity. But what they got was far from their lofty dreams. A building that stood merely four stories high, its dimensions not in feet, but in inches. A glaring oversight, and a stark reminder of the perils of blind trust. And then there's Barbara Ernie, a nomad from the 18th century, who carried with her not just a trunk of belongings, but a world of deceit. Innkeepers, lured by tales of treasures within the trunk, would soon discover its true contents. Not jewels or gold, but a partner in crime, ready to pilfer and plunder. But beyond such deceptions, there are those where it borders on the unknown. Imagine people who say they are from the future. It's hard to believe, but until they start proving it with their actions, this is a world where the ordinary and the extraordinary coexist, where the boundaries of time and space are blurred, where the known and the unknown intertwine. This is the world of Andrew Carlson, Rudolf Fentz, the Swedish time traveler, and Mr. Mool, individuals who claim to have experienced the extraordinary. And we'll start with a story that seems to have been taken straight from the pages of a science fiction novel. It's a story that has intrigued, baffled, and sparked debates among skeptics and believers alike. This is the story of Andrew Carlson, a man who dared to claim the impossible. Imagine, if you will, a man who seemingly appears out of nowhere, a man with no past, no records, no trace of his existence before a certain point in time. This man, Andrew Carlson, steps into the limelight not as a hero or a celebrity, but as an enigma wrapped in a riddle. His story begins in the bustling world of the stock market, a place where fortunes are made and lost in the blink of an eye. But for Carlson, it was a playground where he seemed to have an uncanny knack for predicting the unpredictable, for navigating the tumultuous waves of the market with an ease that was nothing short of extraordinary. But who was Andrew Carlson? Was he a genius, a fraud, or as he claimed, a traveler from a time yet to come? Andrew Carlson, our protagonist, emerged in the world of stocks and shares, a world often ruled by uncertainty and chance. Yet for Carlson, it seemed as if he had a map to this labyrinth of numbers and trends. With an uncanny precision, he bought and sold stocks, his investments always turning into gold. His wealth grew exponentially, week after week, month after month, until he amassed a staggering $350 million. This was no ordinary feat. The stock market, as many of you may know, is a volatile beast. Predicting its behavior with consistent accuracy is something even the most seasoned investors struggle with. Yet, here was Carlson, a man with no past, no records, seemingly playing the market like a virtuoso pianist plays a grand piano. His success was so extraordinary that it raised eyebrows. It was too perfect, too consistent. The Securities Commission took notice. They couldn't ignore such an anomaly. Was it a fraud? Was it insider trading? Or was it something else entirely? The mystery deepened and the FBI was brought in to unravel it. They arrested Carlson, a man who had seemingly materialized out of thin air, a man who had turned the stock market into his personal gold mine. They expected resistance, they expected denial, they expected a fight, but what they got was something entirely different. Carlson did not resist. He did not deny. He did not fight. Instead, he calmly looked into the eyes of his captors and told them a story that was beyond belief. He claimed that he was not of this time. He claimed that he had traveled from the year 2256. He claimed to be a time traveler. Imagine the shock, the disbelief, the incredulity that must have swept through the room. Here was a man, arrested for his inexplicable success in the stock market, claiming to be from the future. It was a claim that defied logic, that defied understanding, that defied the very laws of nature as we know them. Yet there was something about Carlson, something about the calm certainty in his voice, something about the look in his eyes that gave one pause. Could it be? Could this man truly be a visitor from a time yet to come? It was a concept that belonged in the realm of science fiction, not in the cold, hard reality of a federal investigation. 
Yet they had a duty to uncover the truth, no matter how unbelievable it might be. They began by delving into Carlson's past, or rather, his lack thereof. They searched for records, for any trace of his existence before his sudden emergence in the world of finance. But they found nothing. It was as if Andrew Carlson had simply materialized out of thin air. Every lead they followed, every stone they turned, only deepened the mystery. Then came the interrogation. Carlson, calm and composed, reiterated his claim. He spoke of his journey from the year 2256, of his knowledge of future events, of his decision to use this knowledge to amass wealth in our time. He spoke with a certainty that was unnerving. His words painted a picture of a future far beyond our time, a future filled with advancements and possibilities that we can only dream of. Yet the question remained, was Carlson a fraud? A master manipulator spinning a web of lies? Or was he truly a time traveler, a man from a future we can barely comprehend? The FBI found themselves grappling with these questions, caught in a whirlwind of doubt and disbelief. As the investigation progressed, the mystery of Andrew Carlson only deepened. The man who claimed to be from the future remained an enigma, a puzzle that seemed to have no solution. The investigation had begun as a quest for answers, but it had quickly turned into a journey into the unknown. After his arrest and the subsequent investigation that had left more questions than answers, Carlson found himself in the confines of a jail cell. Yet, the walls of his cell could not contain the mystery that surrounded him. The world waited with bated breath, wondering what would become of the man who claimed to have journeyed through time. Then, in a twist that seemed to be ripped straight from the pages of a thriller, Carlson vanished. A month after his incarceration, an unknown benefactor posted a staggering $1 million bail for him. The world waited for Carlson to step out from behind the bars, waited for him to speak, to explain, to prove his extraordinary claims. But Carlson had other plans. He disappeared, as mysteriously as he had appeared. One moment he was there, and the next, he was gone. No trace of him remained. It was as if he had simply evaporated into thin air, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and a mystery that seemed to grow with each passing moment. Had he returned to his time as he claimed he could? Had he slipped away into obscurity, leaving behind a tale that would be told and retold for years to come? Or was there another explanation, another twist in the tale that was yet to be revealed? The disappearance of Andrew Carlson added another layer to the enigma that surrounded him. It was a development that left the world stunned, that left the FBI grappling with a mystery that seemed to defy all logic. The man from the future, the man who had turned the stock market into his personal playground, was gone. And all that remained was a story that would continue to intrigue, to baffle, and to spark debates for years to come. News of Carlson's extraordinary claims and his subsequent disappearance spread like wildfire. Media outlets from Japan to Australia, from Germany to the UK, picked up the story. Articles were written, debates were held, theories were spun. The world was abuzz with the tale of Andrew Carlson, the man who had seemingly stepped out of the future and into our present. Yet, amidst the flurry of media coverage, the FBI stood firm. They denied the existence of Andrew Carlson. They dismissed the story as fiction, as a fabrication. But their denials did little to quell the public's fascination. If anything, it only added fuel to the fire. The story of Andrew Carlson was no longer just a tale of a man and his extraordinary claims. It had become a global phenomenon, a narrative that had captured the world's imagination. It was a story that challenged our understanding of reality, that invited us to question, to wonder, to dream. Yet, for all the media coverage, for all the debates and discussions, the mystery of Andrew Carlson remained. Who was he? Where did he come from? Where did he go? The questions lingered unanswered, adding to the enigma that was Andrew Carlson. His story, as baffling as it was captivating, continued to echo in the corridors of time, a testament to the enduring allure of the unknown. As we reach the end of the tale of Andrew Carlson, we find ourselves standing at the edge of a mystery that remains unsolved. The man who claimed to be a time traveler from the year 2256, who dazzled the world with his uncanny success in the stock market, who vanished as mysteriously as he appeared, leaves behind a narrative that continues to captivate and confound us. In the grand tapestry of time, 
The tale of Andrew Carlson is but a single thread, yet it is a thread that shines with a brilliance that is hard to ignore. It is a thread that weaves a narrative of mystery and intrigue, of questions and possibilities, of the known and the unknown. As we leave behind the enigma of Andrew Carlson, we find ourselves on the threshold of another tale that is equally captivating, equally confounding. This is the tale of Rudolf Fentz, a man whose story is as much a journey through time as it is a journey into the unknown. Picture this. New York, 1951. The city is a symphony of sounds and sights, a vibrant tapestry of life in all its complexity. Amidst the hustle and bustle, a man named Rudolf Fentz walks along a dark street. He is an anomaly in this world, a figure from another era, his attire a stark contrast to the fashion of the day. Rudolf Fentz, a man out of time, a man who would soon become the center of a mystery that continues to baffle and intrigue. His story begins with an accident, an unfortunate incident that would set in motion a series of events that would captivate the world. Fentz was dressed in clothes that were reminiscent of the late 19th century. His coat, his hat, his shoes, all were out of place in the world of 1951. He was a man who seemed to belong to a different time, a different era. Yet, here he was, walking the streets of New York City, a city that was a far cry from the world he claimed to know. But before the pieces of the puzzle could be put together, tragedy struck. Fence was involved in a car accident. The city that was a symphony of sounds and sights, a vibrant tapestry of life, became the backdrop of a tragic incident that would set in motion a series of events that would captivate the world. As Fence lay on the streets of New York City, his life hanging in the balance, the mystery of his appearance deepened. Who was Rudolf Fence? Where had he come from? Why was he dressed in clothes that belonged to a different era? The questions were many, the answers elusive. The police were tasked with unraveling the mystery of a man who seemed to have stepped out of a different era, a man whose very existence defied the linear progression of time as we understand it. They delved into his past, searching for any trace of his existence, but what they found only deepened the mystery. There were no records of Rudolf Fence. It was as if he had simply materialized out of thin air. The only clue to his identity was a set of items found in his possession. An old coin, a letter dated 1876, a business card with his name, all were relics of a bygone era. They were pieces of a puzzle that seemed to have no solution, fragments of a mystery that was as captivating as it was confounding. The police were left with more questions than answers. It was a story that demanded to be told, that demanded to be heard. News of Fence's sudden appearance and the subsequent investigation spread like wildfire. Media outlets from all corners of the globe picked up the story. Articles were written, debates were held, theories were spun. The world was abuzz with the tale of Rudolf Fence, the man who had seemingly stepped out of the past and into the present. As we reach the end of the tale of Rudolf Fence, we find ourselves standing at the edge of a mystery that remains unsolved. The man who disappeared in 1876 and reappeared in 1951, who walked the streets of New York City dressed in the attire of a bygone era, leaves behind a narrative that continues to captivate and confound us. Now let's move on to the latest story where one photo was able to turn other people's lives around. In the vast tapestry of the Wild West, few figures loom as large as William Henry McCarty, more famously known as Billy the Kid. His name alone evokes images of dusty towns, gunfights at high noon, and the lawless frontier that was the American West. But while tales of his exploits are many, tangible pieces of his existence are few and far between. And among these, nothing is more sought after than a photograph, a single frame capturing a moment in the life of this legendary outlaw. Imagine, if you will, a world before smartphones, before cameras were in every pocket, a time when capturing a moment was neither easy nor commonplace. In this world, a photograph wasn't just a click away. It was a luxury, an event, a piece of art. Now, in this world, imagine the enigma that was Billy the Kid, a young man whose life was as fleeting as a desert mirage, but whose legacy was as enduring as the mountains. In his short 21 years on this earth, he became one of the most infamous outlaws of his era. Yet for all his notoriety, for all the stories and legends that surrounded him, tangible proof of his existence remained elusive. By the year 2011, amidst the vast annals of history and the countless artifacts of the Wild West, 
there was but a single, solitary photograph that had been officially confirmed to be of Billy. Just one. In a world where we're inundated with images, where we can see the face of anyone from any corner of the globe, the idea that only one confirmed image of such a legendary figure existed is nothing short of astounding. It's like finding a single drop of water in the vastness of the Sahara, a beacon of truth in a sea of myths and legends. And now picture this, a sunlit afternoon in 2010 in the heart of Fresno, California. A collector with an eye for the unique wanders through a humble junk shop. The air is thick with the scent of old books, worn leather, and the faint whispers of countless yesterdays. As he sifts through the odds and ends, his fingers brush against two nondescript cardboard boxes filled with photographs. To the untrained eye, they might seem like mere remnants of someone else's life, but to him, they beckon with the promise of a story. Among these photographs, a 4X5 tintype catches his attention. It's a simple image, a group of men engrossed in a game of croquet, their faces etched with the joys and sorrows of their time. Little did he know, as he handed over a mere dollar two for this photograph and two others, that he was about to unearth a piece of history that would send ripples through the world of Western Americana. For as he gazed upon this tintype, a realization dawned. This wasn't just any group of cowboys. There, amidst the players, stood a figure that seemed to leap out from the annals of history, Billy the Kid, the legendary outlaw captured in a candid moment playing croquet with his gang, the Regulators. The weight of this discovery was staggering. It was like stumbling upon a needle in a haystack, a diamond in the rough. The emotions that such a find evokes are profound. It's a heady mix of disbelief, awe, and reverence. To think that this photograph, a priceless artifact, was lying forgotten in a thrift store, waiting for its story to be told once more. It's a testament to the unpredictability of life, to the idea that history is not just found in grand museums or stately archives, but sometimes in the most unexpected of places. Could this truly be an authentic snapshot of the legendary outlaw? Or was it just another imitation, a shadow of the real thing? The road to authentication is paved with doubt, skepticism, and countless questions. Every detail of the photograph, every shadow, and every face would be subjected to the most rigorous examination. The stakes were high. The difference between an authentic photograph and a forgery was not just a matter of historical accuracy, it was a matter of legacy, of preserving the truth for future generations. The journey began with the involvement of National Geographic, a name synonymous with exploration and discovery. Their dedication to uncovering the truth mirrored the collector's own passion. Together, they embarked on a quest that would take them to the very heart of the Wild West, to the landscapes that Billy the Kid once roamed. They traveled to New Mexico, seeking the very location captured in the photograph, hoping to find echoes of the past in the present. The challenges were immense. Time had transformed the landscapes, and the world of Billy the Kid had faded into the mists of history. But with determination and a keen eye, they found it. The now abandoned building in the background of the photograph, the exact rock piers, the old lumber that had witnessed the antics of the regulators. Yet, the physical journey was just the beginning. The photograph then had to face the experts at Kagan's, a firm that specialized in Western Americana. Their skepticism was palpable. After all, genuine photographs of Billy the Kid were rarer than the rarest gems. Many had tried to pass off forgeries, hoping to cash in on the legend. But as they examined the tintype, using facial recognition software and comparing it with known images of the regulators, the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. When we speak of Billy the Kid, we're not just speaking of an outlaw from the Wild West. We're speaking of a symbol, a representation of rebellion, of freedom, of a time when the world was wild and untamed. And in this world, where legends were born with every sunrise, tangible proof of their existence becomes invaluable. It's not just about the monetary value. It's about the emotional, historical, and cultural weight these artifacts carry. The discovery of the tintype in that Fresno thrift store was not just a find, it was a revelation. Here was a photograph, a moment frozen in time, that held within its frame a piece of the Wild West. The estimated value of this photograph a staggering $5 million. But can you truly put a price on a piece of history? On a window to a world long gone? 
on the emotions that surge through you as you gaze upon the face of a legend? To put this in perspective, consider another photograph of Billy the Kid, one that was auctioned off in 2011. This image, capturing the young outlaw with his signature Winchester carbine and Colt 45 pistol, fetched a breathtaking $2.3 million. It wasn't just the highest bidder's deep pockets that determined this value. It was the collective acknowledgement of its historical significance. This photograph, like the one discovered in Fresno, was more than just an image. It was a bridge to the past, a tangible connection to a time of cowboys, outlaws, and frontier justice. The words of the owner of Kagan's, upon authenticating the thrift store find, resonate deeply. Perhaps the single most compelling piece of Western Americana that we have ever seen. These words capture the essence of the photograph's importance. It wasn't just about the image. It was about the stories it told, the emotions it evoked, and the legacy it upheld. The photograph, believed to be over 137 years old, was not just a depiction of cowboys from a bygone era. It was a snapshot of history, capturing a moment when Billy the Kid and Sheriff Pat Garrett, two figures whose destinies were inextricably intertwined, stood side by side. The irony was palpable. Here were two men, one an outlaw and the other the lawman who would eventually end his life, captured in a moment of camaraderie. The journey to authenticate this photograph was nothing short of an emotional odyssey. Each step, each revelation, was a roller coaster of emotions, hope, doubt, elation, and trepidation. Experts were consulted, facial recognition software was employed, and historical records were scoured. And with each affirmation, the weight of the photograph's significance grew. To think that such a priceless artifact, a piece of history that could very well change our understanding of the Wild West, was discovered at a humble flea market is a testament to the unpredictability of life. It's a reminder that treasures are not always buried deep beneath the earth or locked away in vaults. Sometimes, they hang on walls, waiting for their stories to be told. The emotions that such a discovery evokes are profound. It's a heady mix of serendipity, wonder, and reverence. It's a reminder of the magic that exists in the everyday, of the stories that are waiting to be discovered, and of the indelible marks that figures like Billy the Kid have left on the pages of history. So, as we reflect on this incredible flea market find, let us remember the power of history, the allure of legends, and the emotions that bind us to the past. As we draw the curtains on today's riveting journey, let's take a moment to reflect on the tales we've traversed, the emotions we've felt, and the lessons we've gleaned. The world of scams and con artists is not just a realm of deception and treachery. It's a mirror to our own vulnerabilities, hopes, and fears. Each story we've shared today is not just a testament to the audacity of the con artist, but also a poignant reminder of the human spirit's fragility. We've seen how the most astute minds can be ensnared by a well-spun tale, how hope can sometimes blind us to the harshest of realities, and how our deepest desires can make us susceptible to the most elaborate of ruses. But beyond the tales of deceit, there's a more profound narrative at play. It's a narrative of resilience, of victims rising from the ashes of betrayal, learning, and growing. It's about the indomitable human spirit that, even when faced with the harshest of deceptions, finds a way to heal, to trust again, and to move forward. So what lessons do we take away from this journey? First and foremost, the importance of skepticism. In a world teeming with stories, not all narratives are spun from the threads of truth. It's crucial to question, to probe, and to seek the truth, even when it's hidden beneath layers of deception. But equally important is the lesson of empathy. For every victim of a scam, there's a story of hope, of dreams shattered, and of trust betrayed. Let's remember to extend our compassion to them, to understand their pain, and to stand by them as they rebuild their lives. In the end, dear listeners, the tales of scams and con artists teach us about the delicate balance between trust and skepticism. They remind us of the age-old adage, trust but verify. As we navigate our lives, let's carry these lessons with us, guarding our hearts, but also keeping them open to the genuine stories of hope, love, and humanity that abound in our world. Thank you for joining us on this emotional roller coaster. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay compassionate, and always, always stay true to yourself.
That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.